I'm uh, Betty Dines. Thank you for pronouncing them correctly. So, <laughs> and um, I'm a senior researcher at the Alzheimer's Center in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I have a background in uh, psychology and neuroinformatics. And I was asked today to tell you uh, something about the uh, state of the field that, you know, led to the question, why we got into disease progression modeling. So disease progression modeling is all about building timelines. And so I thought, let's look at the research timeline of Alzheimer's. Now, which keyboard it was the case? Yes. Right. So, of course, the uh, research timeline starts with Auguste Day, the first patient diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, here we see her brain under a microscope. Um, and what Dr. Alois Alzheimer found there were the aggregates of proteins into plaques between cells and tangles within the cells. So although this kind of marks the start of Alzheimer's disease research, because that's what it is, it, you have an interesting patient and the person dies and you want to figure out why, why this patient had these bizarre complaints. That's research. Um, this is actually the end of the whole disease timeline. So um, we have to wait for almost a hundred years to get into the uh, mechanisms. And um, I think, so today I'll, I'll only touch on highlights a bit. So Please don't feel offended if I left your paper out and tell me, <laughs> raise your hand. Um, but here are two articles that, or studies that show um, the first um, evidence for causes. And, and that's the APP gene or the amyloid precursor protein gene. And it's located on chromosome 21 and people with Down syndrome have three of these. And uh, so the consequence is that they produce a lot of amyloid, way more than normal people do. And uh, in these two studies and a few others, the association was made between this overproduction of amyloid and subsequent forming of plaques. And so people with Down syndrome, many of them, they also develop Alzheimer's disease at very young ages. And this is really um, a key event in the Alzheimer's research because it spurred mechanistic research. If you have a gene, you can build a model and then you can play around with that. And, and that, oh, that actually happened uh, a few years later. So the first APP mouse model was created. Um, uh, the first APP genetic mutation in familial Alzheimer's disease was discovered. At this point, also Bragg staging was um, developed. So we found that based on pathology, you can see stages of increasing pathology and that corresponded to symptoms as well. So there's, I think maybe the start of disease progression modeling, but also in the end. And, and all of this, this brief period of time already led to the amyloid cascade hypothesis. But to study that in patients, you need a bit more. And that's um, biomarkers. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's the next big step that was important for our field to have a biomarker to be able to show that there might be pathology in the brain in a living person. Um, and in the 90s, um, we were able to measure amyloid beta 42 in the cerebral spinal fluid and tau. And then a bit later, we could also image it, uh, this with PET. Um, and uh, uh, this really, marks for me the start of um, disease progression modeling in a way that we can apply it to patients at one point. Hopefully. 
<clears throat> so um, all the research being performed by them in the models, uh, in mice, uh, with genetics, with cells, uh, cross-sectional models, that led ClickJet to make this figure that was for quite a while uh, like an obligatory figure in everyone's Alzheimer's disease presentation. Um, so he, uh, based on the literature, he thought of uh, the hypothetical um, model of how different pathological processes uh, develop over time in Alzheimer's disease and how it's related to the different clinical stages. Um, but it's hypothetical. <laughs> so he just draw these sigmoids because they look pretty and uh, so they're not really based on real observed data. Um, and uh, and, and uh, what one of the uh, big issues was, and I think still is, is determining the x-axis in a figure like this. So what is actually disease progression? What is disease time? And you can already see it also in this figure, because if you say disease time is just your cognition, then if you look within a cognitive state, it's really difficult to see where a person is in which part of the sigmoid lines that don't really exist. Uh, right. But then shortly hereafter, we had real observed data from the Diane study. So this is an autosomal somal dominant Alzheimer's disease. And um, in this model, so this is this is about patients who carry a genetic mutation in APP presenilin one or two. And uh, what is really interesting about them is that they develop their symptoms around the same time as their parent did. So you can kind of derive an estimated time to your symptom onset or beyond. So here we have kind of a good approximation of our disease timeline. And then using all those new biomarkers that were being, being developed and collected in this cohort, um, um, Bateman and his colleagues were able to concatenate all these cross-sectional observations into really nice trajectories. Um, yeah, and, and what you could see was that increases of amyloid in the CSF actually preceded the increases on the bed. So first there's a bit of overproduction and then 30 years before symptom onset, and then it starts to gradually decline, which means forming on plaques if you look in CSF. Um, yeah, so, um, but uh, this, this familial form of Alzheimer's disease is really rare. It's less than 1% of all the patients. So for people who do not have such mutations, sporadic Alzheimer's disease, we do not have an estimated years to onset. Um, but we do have the biomarkers and we do have the cognitive state. So there have been plenty of papers, and this is one of the few uh, first papers that looked into the effects of abnormal amyloid in people with normal cognition. Um, and this is a population based study in uh, 85 year olds. And what they did was to compare the CSF amyloid levels between uh, uh, different groups of people. So those who remained cognitively normal for the subsequent three years, and those who developed dementia in three years, which I think is quite fast, actually. Um, and these people had very low amyloid values, so very abnormal and similar to those with dementia. It greatly increased the risk to develop dementia. And so also here, amyloid is an early sign of trouble. Um, right. But the thing is, when does it start? So if you want to construct a disease timeline, you want to know where the beginning is. 
and we really do not have a clue whatsoever. Um, but of course, I'm not the only one who's fascinated by this question. There have been uh, many people investigating this and modeling might help. Um, so this is an example of Philip Insel, who uh, made use of repeated biomarker sampling. And on the left, you can see the cerebral spinal fluid amyloid, and on the right, on the pet. So in cerebral spinal fluid, goes down its bed, on the bed, goes up its bed. And, and uh, these people, some of them already had abnormal values. So what he did was just um, uh, a mixed linear model, I think, and fitted these subject lines through the three observed points, which is interesting because then you have your statistical model and you can kind of try to see what happens before and what happens after. Um, but you, I, I'm not quite sure if you can actually see it. Uh, <laughs> But not all these lines always fit, fit perfectly. And also, there's measuring noise. So there's here this one person with a uh, bed, which is one of the stitch line. Uh, it's the first line going up from the top of line in blue uh, for people at home. So there you can see that the uh, bed value actually decreases at the second point and then increases again. Could be measuring noise probably um but if you would would have only had one measuring point then it would be really difficult to predict what the uh, uh, time to uh, amyloid onset was and so it's interesting but it remains difficult and that's also illustrated by um this study of Victor Filimonia, which is really cool. Here he um, also tried to you know, study this question. If we have a, an amyloid bed at, at any given moment, and we measure the amount of amyloid that's on the bed, can we then maybe estimate for how long the person has been aggregating and how fast it will uh, continue to aggregate? And what you can see is that it's uh, um, if you put the uh, amount of amyloid on the x-axis, so that would be then your proxy for disease progression. So the longer the disease is going on, the more amyloid you have on your bed. And he plotted that against the rate of aggregation. So this was measured with repeated measures. And then you see this nice inverted U-curve, which makes sense on a population level that uh, we know that people who have a normal pet and they're older, that some of them will uh, continue to aggregate and develop abnormal amyloid. And that's what you see at the start of the curve. So some people have really high aggregation rates. Um, and then that continues to go on until you have probably a certain saturation in your amyloid pet that your rates start to decrease again and you do not you cannot aggregate anymore. Um, so it's a nice model. It can explain 23% of variance, pretty significant. But it has also very broad confidence levels. So it means for a single individual, it's still really difficult to make this uh, timeline indication. And, and that's, really, uh, I think, uh, illustrated here with those dots that I put a blue circle around. So these people have the same starting point of their amyloid bed. They have the same global burden. And, but some people aggregate like crazy. They're on the top. And other people have almost no aggregation. So, yeah, I don't know. Are they are they just further along in their disease stage? Well, the amount of amyloid at that point doesn't really cannot tell us this. And um, yeah, and then in sporadic AD, we only have the point, so we can only say it's abnormal or not, or near abnormal or not. But we don't really know what happens before it is abnormal. 
So we can do that in autosomal dominant AD, and there we saw the overproduction. But in Alzheimer's and it's already, it's really more difficult. Uh, yeah, this is a bit of a, a digression. So what we, uh, or what I am studying at the moment is uh, cerebral spinal fluid proteomics. And we found in these uh, proteomic data evidence for three biological subtypes for Alzheimer's. So that indicates there might be different causes. The interesting thing is that we can already observe two of these subtypes in cognitively normal individuals. Um, and these subtypes also show increases, or I mean, changes over time in amyloid and tau marks in CSF that become more abnormal. So they kind of uh, suggest that before amyloid is abnormal, different routes can be disrupted. So it complicates things even more. <laughs> okay, so this is what we're trying to do, right? We're constructing this timeline. We think it starts with normal cognition, and then you uh, have already amyloid, and you show decline towards mild cognitive impairment, and then in the end, there's dementia with large-scale irreversible brain, brain damage. Um, but it's not just this simple linear relationship. So we have the different causes before amyloid becomes abnormal. And then we know from the dementia stage that that's really complex as well, because not everybody shows the same symptoms. Not every Alzheimer's patient has predominant memory complaints. Some people have a relatively spared memory, and uh, they show, for example, deficits in visuospatial functioning. And this is really closely related to the uh, places in the brain where you see atrophy. And many studies in the world uh, have shown that there are at least two or three or four subtypes based on atrophy that closely correspond to the symptoms. But this is something we measure at the end. <laughs> and it's also really hard to predict for a person who does not have atrophy to see which route that person will take. And I, I think that's really a problem in the MCI stage. So every patient is actually can be considered to be one spaghetti in this whole bowl of spaghetti. And what we're trying to do is figure out where every uh, spaghetti starts and where it will end. Um, but just looking at the whole ball, it's really difficult to do. And why is this so important? So why is it so important that you are all here and working on this? Well, this is one of the many, many examples. Um, <clears throat> but what we uh, did recently was to see how uh, Differences in people with MCI and a normal amyloid and their rates of progression, how that might influence how we uh, measure effect sizes in clinical trials. So that's quite important because in clinical trials, usually a cognitive outcome is uh, used to determine whether or not the drug works. Um, and here you can see the uh, natural disease trajectory in people with MCI, abnormal amyloids, who uh, corresponded to the uh, inclusion criteria of the Biogen uh, adipenumab uh, trial. And these are individuals from ethne, by the way. Um, and if you look at the subset of these people who start also with exactly the same CDR boxes, score, you can see that after a period of time, there's this whole uh, palette of different disease trajectories. Uh, and, uh, you know, on a group level, we see, and that's what we expect, that people with abnormal amyloid will um, decline. And on the CDR, then the line goes up, that's worse. But there are people who do so much faster than others. And there are even people here at the bottom who stay stable for eight or nine years. Uh, and we really don't know why. 
but it is a problem because if you uh, look at the effect sizes, and that's what we did, we randomly sampled these uh, individuals, and then after 18 months, look at the difference in the CR sum of boxes scores. You get this distribution of effect sizes that reflect uh, noise. So it would be a bit over or under sampling of fast and slow progressors in either the placebo or the treatment group, hypothetical. And, and then the uh, solid lines, they show the 95% uh, of the observations that fall into that. So you can be pretty sure that these effect sizes are more or less uh, chance findings. And then the colored dotted lines, those are the effect sizes that were reported by trials that targeted amyloids. And you can see that most of them fall in there. There's one really big outlier, uh, which I will ignore for this talk <laughs> now, but that's also a failed trial. Um, but what is interesting is that for uh, educatement, we had to engage in the merge trial so engage was really, really negative, um, but emerge was borderline significant. Um, and you can say if you don't replicate, then you know it's difficult to make a really hard statement about this positive result. You can also see that's very close to this 95% confidence interval. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that it's a false positive finding, but it's. Um, important to realize that as long as we do not understand and can predict how fast the person will progress or slow, then we cannot exclude the possibility that our finding, albeit negative, albeit positive, might just be reflecting this random under or over something. So we cannot firmly establish that the drug doesn't work or does unless it's really way out there, except for this dotted line, but I won't get into that one. And okay, so I'll, I'll end with uh, this. In that paper, of course, we also look for the predictors of fast decline. And one of those is the tau levels in the CSF. So very high levels are abnormal and in a group, they're associated with faster decline. And now we go down because the MMS. Uh, and here we have a spaghetti elephant in the room. So I, I, when I looked at the risk factor, I thought, yes, of course, this distribution of chance effect sizes will become smaller because how is obviously related to fast progression, right? And this is really convincing. Uh, <laughs> but this is a group level line. And um, so it doesn't necessarily apply to every single individual in the group. Yes. The clinical trials work on group level lines. Yes. And should they? <laughs> yeah. So maybe as a first starting point, but in the end, it's about a single individual patient that needs to get better. Um, right, so uh, the effect sizes distribution did not get uh, more narrow, it got wider. And that's what you can see here also on the right plot for the progression lines for people with abnormal tau. Yes, on the group level, uh, it goes steeper the decline than in the normal tau group, but there is also more variability. Even if you have abnormal tau, there are people that remain stable for six or seven years. So it's really complex. And, and that brings me to the end of this talk. So I have only questions for you. <laughs> uh, but I hope that um, you can appreciate that abnormal amyloid as a biomarker is a really strong predictor for um, dementia. But also that Alzheimer's disease is heterogeneous at various levels. And I discussed a few molecular entropy um, clinical, clinically, um, but it's probably much more. 
And that means that not one treatment will fit every patient. Um, and apart from uh, the treatment itself, maybe uh, not every outcome measure will pick up the correct changes for every patient. Um, and also for all these different modalities, we see that the initial starting points may not uh, predict the same rate of decline for, other, uh, for every individual. So that makes it even harder. So this goes all back to the x-axis. What is our disease progression timeline? And that's why we're here to, <laughs> to uh, make better models to be able to place people in their timelines. So maybe we need to construct several of these timelines. And hopefully in the end, disease progression modeling will save the day. <laughs> Oh, and uh, please do not ignore the spaghetti, but uh, focus on it. And uh, yeah, that, that was it. <laughs> Wonderful. Plenty of time for discussion and questions. I've got a couple of hours, but I'll hold back for a second. Thank you. Oh, you can. Okay. Um, hi, um, I'm going to talk to you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question just for you, what your thoughts are, because you mentioned about we don't know what happens before amyloid activation. I guess, you know, there are studies that suggest to worry to me, it's people that are finding child with dyslexia being a vulnerable language network compared to people with them who are maybe undoubtedly going to have Alzheimer's, have more of a language at that time. So maybe it was always going to happen, but the vulnerable network and already been to have to make determine what kind of Alzheimer's they are going to get from just just in thought really about maybe you can do the good design for imaging and help yeah yeah I think that imaging is one of the modalities that will help so that's about kind of predicting in what way you'll go um, and uh, so we have all these different types of courses so we have the molecular and the genetic pathways kicking off the pathophysiological uh, processes, but um, we also see that there's indeed different uh, brain networks functionally, uh, these different atrophy patterns, and how these molecular processes translate to vulnerability of specific brain regions, we don't really know. Although we have the Allen Brain Atlas with six individuals, <laughs> Uh, and, and that's a very helpful resource, but it would be, you know, ideal if we would have all this data for within the same people and then at least a hundred, but okay, that's the, the dream. Long -term. Yeah, and long -term. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you know, about fast progressive and slow progressive. I wonder if you can have a good impact on the Because when you look at the actual data, it's not that everyone is fast progressive or slow progressive. If some people are genuinely stable, you might be And then there are actually, there's, there's a floor effect on the figures that actually there's a large proportion that getting slightly better. So it seems would you agree that the initial selection is a, in, is in some sense part of the flaw that part of the value of this modeling might be to, to feed back to the selection of the trial. Yes. Actually, <laughs> um yeah, so actually, I also should have put a spaghetti plot of um, people with MCI without abnormal amyloid. And then you could see that there's way less progression in them compared to people with abnormal amyloid. And, and you're right that for uh, the slow progressors, I lumped in the people who stayed stable. And there are indeed people who kind of improve on the CDR summer boxes. And um, yeah, we don't know. It's probably a mix. So some people have, I think, a genetic architecture 
that helps their brain to uh, respond better to amyloid than others. Uh, and this is something that needs to be investigated, of course, and people are doing that. In Amsterdam, we have a study where we're following people who are 100 years old and older. And there we can also see that some individuals, after they die, they have a lot of amyloid. Uh, oh, I forgot one crucial point. They all have normal cognition, so they're 100 years old and really, you know, uh, fit. Uh, and and uh, there, so the first results are also pointing that their genetic architecture might be a bit different, helping them to cope with the damage that amyloid is uh, doing to the brain. Um, so, um, that change in the twin star perception of the two groups, which group, blue uh, circles around the difference in amyloid perception. Is it well known that ATP there are high exponents in other spectrum, which is why ratio is so important in the amyloid biology? Yeah, for the uh, amyloid, uh, A beta 42. Yeah, so um, here people were selected on PET or CSF indeed. Um, that would be one way to kind of so incorporate the production effects in there as well. Yeah, so. I think what you were saying, David was saying, we need more complex models to put in more information to better distinguish between these spaghettis. What? Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, well, um, so I don't think that it's really executed, um, but it's just difficult to measure. So for uh, vascular damage, we can also use the MRI, and we see that it adds a bit of information, um, but the amyloid still explains a lot of the variability in progression rates, uh, as in people who have it, they have just an increased risk compared to people who don't. Um, but I think that's where proteomics might help. Yeah, because then, so now we can already measure about 4,000 proteins. And so you can touch upon more biological processes. And perhaps uh, this will give us more insights into uh, various different other aspects that might explain this heterogeneity. Um, yeah, and uh, for alpha synuclein we're almost able, or well, we have RT quick now, so that will show us whether or not uh, you have the aggregates, and that will open up a whole new door to investigate that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess the, we do have the, the biomarker problem, <laughs> positive problem in that sense. Yeah. Maybe. Um, I was wondering about your heterogeneity and CDR smallboxes in general being misinterpreted. If that's where some of the heterogeneity is, especially also how people are feeling when we're only here from one time of year, people could be rather anxious and feel triple point five and like the game is a social judgment that we're going about. So, wondering if that's where some of that heterogeneity is that problem. Sure, yeah, and that's not only the CDR sum of boxes, but also uh, uh, for all these cognitive measures, there's noise and there's mood and uh, whatever that can influence it. 
uh, but with your biomarkers, you also have noise in measuring, like the pet values that we saw that went up and down. So for to get a really complete picture, you would want to have the multiple points uh, to so at least more than three, I think, <laughs> to have a better idea about the trend in a person and not just the noise. But there's some people are doing that, right? We running trials where they yeah. monitor people for a while and they try to split the stables from the progressives, but even within a fast response to tell identified group. Is that going to be required, do you think, because of all the sources of the sound? I don't know. If, if you go back, then if you have a trial of 18 months, you know, to be honest, not a lot is happening in 18 months. Do you and have this... a sample, a sample size here with the whole ME and CIs or? Yeah, so this is a subset specifically selected to have the same CR process also, because you know where you start, that can also be maybe a hundred, two hundred NCIs. I think a hundred, maybe, maybe a bit less even. But also in a bigger group, you can see that um, the real progression becomes apparent after two or three years. And that in the 18 months, it's really um difficult to measure decline with the instruments that we have now. Sorry, but these all yeah. So the dream is that disease progression modeling can comb the spaghetti out and require a single visit in order to stay someone just before they're about to progress. Yeah, they can know who is that one person who just goes yeah. <laughs> yeah, and filter out all those people who stay stable or improve. And uh, because they really mess up your ability to be able to see whether there's a effect in your placebo or your treatment group. Yeah. Interesting to see in discussion for tomorrow as well, but even now with Kevin, whether or not what implications that would have for the clinical trial, for the ultimate description of the drug that is used as that tool in the trial in the first place, whether or not the doctor would use that and trust that tool regardless of it being on the label. Yeah well I think I think it will be revolutionary because if you can uh, if you have a more homogeneous group and your drug seems to work on these people who tend to show a fast progression because there's less variability, your uh, uh, the 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 effect size to observe by chance will be slimmer, so you will be more sensitive to detect a real effect of the drug. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sold. Just trying to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now just solve it. Question ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm, uh, sorry, just to look at a comment online yeah. about things. Do you have questions? Sorry, sorry, could you uh, repeat the question, please? Oh, uh, oh yeah, I will. Oh, yeah. Yes, thanks. So, David, would you produce ever more elegant models which target smaller and smaller groups? And we could end up in trials that are um, very tentatively useful in very small populations. And um, that's not necessarily a, a problem with drugs companies because they'll get approval for a very small group and then it'll be applied far beyond that. Well, um, it is small, but maybe the drug companies seem, seem, seem to think that they're not they're not interested in refining the screening because of reduces the target. I, see, but, uh, I guess I'm playing devil's advocate sure, yeah, here, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. pointing out that we need treatments for both fast progressive and slow progressive. Now, you may demonstrate efficacy more elegantly. More focused on finding for the fast progressive, but that would seem to be a sensible stage of early efficacy trial. My concern is that we then skip the stage which shows that it's uh, efficacy in a much wider group, which is actually the group that's treated. Yeah, okay, so this is a really good comment. So if you get smaller subgroups, then you need to screen more people. So that takes time, but you can also treat less people, maybe. or maybe you can treat them better. Um, 
I think that the fast progressors are the most imperative group as well as a cleat to be focusing on because they will develop dementia probably in a short amount of time. Whereas if you stay stable for about 10 years, there's more time maybe. So maybe we can focus, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe this is in it or what I'm saying. Well, I'm particularly, <laughs> you don't want to increase your risk of an adverse event with a an anti amyloid therapy, for example, and they have quite a few brain swelling things like that. Yeah. You don't want to be taking that drug for 10 years. No. no. Yeah, and maybe, you know, they are just lagging behind or they have a different mechanism and that after the 10 years they'll go up. But then we have these models that we can filter them and predict when exactly, hopefully, at one point. Yes, hopefully, you'll still, the drug will still apply to the, the slower responders, yeah. but they won't be prescribed yet because they don't need it yet. Think it's yeah, I was thinking that maybe faster or slow progressors could also be at the, the stage they are in. So maybe, uh, I don't know if it's related to what you said, um, but, but uh, yeah, maybe later in the they change. Um, yeah, I guess the problem is that I was highlighting is that the screening protocol has that traditional timeline. Everyone's on the timeline defined by that CDR some boxes, for example, in the biomarker image. So you can't tell them that we're so progressive that way, unless you've got a multi or a progression model. Yes. That's okay, one question. Um, any thoughts on, I think we talked about noisy, new assessments, so I think we talked about the thoughts on the composite studies. Yeah. 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 So the question is whether noise in measuring declining cognition might be solved in a bit by using composite scales. And uh, yeah, perhaps. So sometimes you see a floor effect in a measure or a ceiling effect. And that's the reason why you cannot measure changes. Um, probably you would need to have different types of com composites for different clinical stages. Uh, I'm not a neuropsychologist. I know that they can be a bit fussy about what measures, what test measures, what exactly and how to combine it. But it seems like a reasonable way to get rid of the noise. Um, but if you're combining tests in a really, really early stage, the preclinical Alzheimer's disease stage, when you have normal cognition, most of these tests were not developed to measure decline in normal people. They were developed to um, show a difference between people with dementia and not dementia. Um, so by combining then these tests that aren't sensitive anyway, sometimes you also lose signal. Both both together, you still got a floor. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, I'd like to know actually uh, a little more about uh, your work on uh, economics for, uh, in uh, CSF. And uh, I have one naive question, which is uh, is it possible to keep CSF in the fridge? That, for example, people early on or before that missing, for which we know a lot of things happen, we can get back their CSF and to the kind of analysis. Yes. Okay. And then you could maybe go back to the slide and show us how it went a bit too quick for me to understand what it was about. Yeah, I know it was a bit of a digression. Uh, I hope I'm going yeah. in the wrong direction. And so, Okay, this is the right direction. And the question is on cerebral spinal fluid, if you can keep it in the fridge, and yes, you can. So there's biobanks, and you can refrigerate it and then thaw it and do new cool stuff with it. And proteomics only takes uh, 0.1 milliliter, uh, which is really little. Um, and then you, you have, have to uh, um, thaw the whole sample though. Yeah, and in bet you can refreeze it. And we do experiments also to see whether or not that affects your measurements. So for some uh, essays, it does, and for others, it doesn't. Uh, 
And this is one slide that I didn't explain. <laughs> And what was your question? Okay, so could you explain what we see? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. All right. So, um, the dot in the box is a three dimensional uh, figure of individuals, and the colors uh, reflect to the subtype that they load highest on. So, what I did um, was to use non negative matrix factorization to cluster individuals and proteins at the same time. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the three-dimensional plot shows that uh, some people load higher on a particular protein cluster. Um, but you can also see that there's a lot of dots in the middle. So there's probably multiple processes going on in an individual. And then in the heat map, we see in every column the average concentration of a particular protein. And in the rows, we see then the three subtypes. And a red color means that you have a higher than average concentration of that protein. And uh, on the left, I have this first part annotated with a green uh, bar. And that's uh, a group of proteins that are involved in blood-brain barrier dysfunction. And this is something that we also see in Alzheimer's disease patients. So this is a result from the normal, normal people. And um, that uh, uh, some individuals have a blood-brain barrier that becomes a bit more leaky. And so more peripheral proteins get in and other processes they can tone down. Uh, and uh, those processes are related to neuronal plasticity, for example. These protein concentrations, they become lower than average and normal. Then the group in the middle here, in the normal people, I have no idea. <laughs> and these people also remain stable in amyloid and in tau. So this might already help also in filtering out people. And then the group at the other end of the heat map, Thank you. <laughs> and that's annotated with orange. And this is really interesting as well because these individuals, they show high concentrations of proteins that are associated with increased amyloid metabolism, neuronal plasticity, um, astrocyte function just uh, is upregulated. And so it kind of is implying that also in sporadic AD, at least for a subgroup of people, increased amyloid metabolism may precede the aggregation of plaques. But not in every. Which next step is it? Uh, this has a lot of columns. So this is the EMIF Alzheimer's disease multimodal biomarker discovery cohort. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we also replicated this in Edney. Yeah. And um, what is also interesting, because Edney and EMIF, they use different approaches to measure the proteomics. So an EMIF, uh, an unbiased or untargeted approach was used. But in Edney, only about 300 proteins were measured, and they were specifically targeted uh, for Alzheimer's-related processes. But you see the same patterns emerging. And I think that's another strength of proteomics that if you measure a lot of proteins, you can pick up the same processes, even though you don't have the identical set matched in different data sets. How far could you get towards the same thing? I'm going to look into that shortly. Is it starting from September. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was my second Yeah, that's this. Uh, yeah, one of the things. 
I think this is a really interesting uh, paper from Cliff Jack in the uh, brain. It's one of the first studies that was um, trying to investigate the relationship between amyloid burden on PET and tau burden on PET. And uh, they found this uh, nonlinear relationship between the amount of amyloid and then higher signal on your tau bed. Um, and, and what they then did, so okay. this is the, uh, I think, the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging and the ADRC. Uh, and I think what is really interesting is that when you divide these, this whole group up into different age ranges, you see that there's a bit of a different relationship between your amyloid and tau signal. So these young individuals are at the top of this uh, slide. Yeah. Oh, uh, then there, there, the red, uh, and then a bit lower, this one. Here you see that there's um, not the highest amyloid burden on the x-axis, but their tau signal is really high on the y-axis. And then if you go towards older ages, then the amyloid burden might be a bit more, but the tau signal becomes less. And I have the feeling that this is reflecting that depending on your age, uh, different processes might be involved. And that's also an idea that lives in the world that if you develop dementia at a very young age, often these people have multiple genetic risk factors. Uh, and, and that might result in a more aggressive disease. Uh, I discussed this with, with Jack yeah. at, at virtual AOC. I think it was last year's one um, via a chat. And he said it happens in medicine more generally. Younger onset versions of disease tend to be more aggressive yeah. uh, and often have genetic factors as well. But he wasn't surprised by it at all. No, no, but I think that the data really um, illustrates that or strengthens that idea. So it's another complicating factor. So whatever happens with Alzheimer's disease, it might not be similar for uh, all the different ages that people develop. So do we need to include age as a continuous factor somehow, or do we need to split things up by this strata? Well, I, I, it's, I don't have solutions for all of these <laughs> questions, <laughs> but I do think it's important to realize because um, one way to um, uh, think about this x-axis as disease progression is to use just biological age, right? And then you assume younger is starting and older is further along, um, but you would get uh, relationships that might not reflect your disease progression, but the differences between early and late onset people. And you might interpret that in a, well, maybe incorrect way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll take a break. Oh, one last question, just yeah, for you. I think you will just have a little bit there because I think the environment is fine because uh, I think they could like carry out some type of uh, adding environmental factors. Yes. Yeah, so that would be interesting as well to see how those factors influence everything. So I think it actually complicates it even more. Um, but indeed, we, uh, so in Amsterdam, we're also following a cohort of monopsychotic twins. So they're genetically identical. And what uh, and so any difference between them can only be explained by what's different, and that's then unique environmental factors. Um, and uh, some of these twins are discordant for amyloid. So one twin has abnormal amyloid and the other doesn't. And uh, this kind of suggests that these unique environmental factors might influence the onset of amyloid abnormality. Uh, we have followed them and we're still following them. And uh, some of these twins that were normal became abnormal. Uh, so it's only kind of, you know, uh, delaying the onset. Uh, 
but finding which factor is hugely complicated. You need really big groups. Yeah. That's like Betty again. We're going to have three of these spaces until the next talk. Of the rest of the